And it can sort of turn into a bit of a confirmation bias. You feel a certain way about yourself, whether that's rooted in reality or not, right? So the way that you feel about yourself is right now pretty bad. You feel like you're worthless. You feel like you're not pretty. You feel like all the things you described. And that may or may not be rooted in reality. I'm assuming it's not rooted in reality. But you start to interpret everything that happens to you through the lens of that belief that you have about yourself. So since you think you're worthless, you're going to interpret what happens around you as proof that that feeling is true. Right? So because you have this sort of hypothesis about yourself, everything that happens around you, you're going to assume is proof of that. When that may not be the case, there's a lot of other stuff that is proving the opposite point that you're just ignoring or filtering out. Hey everybody, before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 158. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people, just like you. And today I have a few questions from you guys. I'm doing a Q&A episode today. Uh, just very straightforward. I have three really good questions, and I'm excited to do my best in reading through them. I will say up front that some of the questions are a little bit longer, and I'm trying going to be trying to paraphrase them a little bit. And one of the uh, questions does talk a little bit about suicide, so just be aware of that. Not really anything severe, but um, the concept is thrown out there. If that's something you're really sensitive to, just be aware of that. That would be in the uh, second question, so not the first question here. Um, but yeah, before we get into the, the questions, just a couple little updates from Duff World. Um, first off, a family update. My wife and I, we got a new puppy. <laughs> it, uh, we got a, a little girl puppy. She is uh, nine weeks, probably. She's an Australian Shepherd and Lab mix, we believe. We rescued her, um, or she was a rescue. We didn't rescue her. That always sounds weird to say, but she was a rescue dog, and, and we got her from an organization. And it's going really well. We've had her since this, uh, well, it'd be about a week ago at the time you're listening to this, if, you, if, you, if you're listening to it on the day that the episode's released on a Thursday. But um, yeah, had her for almost a week now, and it's going quite well. She is definitely a puppy. She's chewing on everything, nipping things, and doing that whole thing. But, you know, potty training is going really well. She's, she's taking well to, you know, learning tricks and and being very sweet with the family and stuff like that, aside from the normal puppy stuff. Uh, and I'm really excited. It's, it's going to be nice to have a big dog and a small dog. Our, our other dog, Olive, is a tiny little thing. She's a Chihuahua Italian Greyhound mix, and she's like seven pounds soaking wet. So she's tiny. And our new dog, Clover, she's going to get a little bit bigger, and she's a sweet dog. And I'm excited to have, you know, the contrast there. Um, another update from more depth the psych related stuff i have talked a few times on the podcast about the fact that i've been writing a dementia book so a book about aging and uh, mental or cognitive rather disorders related to aging such as dementia conditions and uh, it is nearly done it's something that i've been working on for quite a while now but really pouring myself into this this past year and it's in the finishing stages just have a few little extra touches to put on it given some feedback that I got from my beta readers and hopefully by next week it'll be in for editing and then after that we'll be pushing it out hopefully for release in June or July so if that's something that's interesting to you basically it's it's a guide for family members the the full title is going to be does my mom have dementia a oh shoot I forgot my own title I just decided on it today um 
Does My Mom Have Dementia? The Essential Guide to Dementia in Parents and Loved Ones. So it's going to be something where if you have a friend, family member, parent even that that is aging and you're concerned about possible dementia or you just have no idea what it means when their doctor says they have dementia, this is the book for you because we go through it in detail but very clearly stated. We avoid unnecessary jargon and lots of... um, you know, uh, examples and clarifications, case studies, things like that to make it really, really clear for you. So does my mom have dementia? Keep tuned here. If you are interested in that, obviously on like social media is the best place to get news about that kind of thing. And I will also send out an email to my newsletter, letting them know when it's out. So thank you for uh, following along for the ride. If you've been interested in it for a while, the end is in sight and I'm really excited to put the book out there. Okay, but without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the questions. Okay, so this first question, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit and just talk about what they wrote and then get to their question. Essentially, this is a person who um, is a teacher, and they first started having panic attacks and, and, and strong, strong, anxious feelings when they were doing their student teaching and their internship. Um, then they kind of got this sense of dread about working so hard for their teaching credential and then hating the job. So they were having panic attacks. They ended up quitting the internship. Uh, The next one they found was better and they were able to finish the internship and found a love for teaching again. Then their first job as a teacher was not a good fit. Um, Their thoughts drove them to a lot of more panic attacks and they ended up leaving the short-term job early by lying about being sick, Um, which I would argue you may or may not have been totally lying about that, you know, sick in what way, I I suppose. Um, And then fast forward to now, um, I'm going to read the question. I've been teaching for 15 years in the same district, and I love my job and the people I work with. However, after a medical procedure recently, I had another panic attack episode, and going back to work scared me more than anything. Anytime I would think about work, the attacks grew stronger. I'm working on the exposure techniques you write about, but here goes. Finally, my question is... Is there any other or further technique for losing my association of work with my first anxiety attack? I feel like life would be so much better if I could still go into work even when going through anxiety ridden slash panic episodes. So thank you for the question. Um, It's super frustrating. And I could understand why you're worried about this because uh, you've had a pattern of this. You've had a pattern over time of feeling like you have been sort of thwarted by your anxiety. I can't think of a better word than that, but it's, it's stopped you in your tracks and you've had to abandon ship feeling like you need to abandon tasks due to your anxiety. And you know, the thing is, that's exactly what anxiety wants you to do. One way to think of it is that anxiety is trying to be your protector. It doesn't necessarily feel like it, but it is, you know, I've talked about it before. Anxiety is very much tied to your fight or flight instinct. And even when it's not the physical changes that happen, anxiety is still trying to protect you. You know, in the wild, anxiety is going to help you notice danger very quickly and then react to it and keep you safe. In daily life, you really don't often need that kind of response unless there's like an actual emergency situation. But anxiety does try to keep you safe. It's just misguided in the way that it does that. So in daily life, what it does is anxiety tells you that situations are threatening or scary or dangerous when they really might not be. And as a result, you avoid the situation. Every time you do that, you're basically feeding your anxiety. Every time you let anxiety talk you out of something or avoid a situation, you're giving your anxiety a cookie and saying, get bigger, get bigger. Basically, what you're saying is, thank you for keeping me safe. Here, keep getting bigger so you can notice more and more danger in my environment to keep me away from it and keep me safe. So you're feeding that anxiety by the avoidance. Now, sometimes you need to bail out. I don't want to be completely insensitive about this because... um, you know, sometimes it's just too much. You know, you're having constant anxiety attacks. You are panicky. You might be in danger actually because of the way it's making you behave. It's just extreme discomfort, whatever it is. For some reason, it's just not realistic. And that's okay. Sometimes that needs to happen. But in general, over the long term, we want to be working towards stopping that kind of avoidant behavior and instead moving toward those things. So this brings us to what you were talking about in your question. You said you've been working on exposure techniques, which is, which is great. Um, exposure exercises are definitely important in a situation like this. Just as a refresher, exposure means that you are doing some approximation of the situation that causes you anxiety. 
So in this case, you might start from the bottom with imagined exposure. So not actually doing anything, but you know, being in your own space and imagining going back to school and teaching. You could even imagine step by step. You can imagine your commute. You can imagine walking through the doors of the building, going to your class, setting up for students trickling in that whole thing and work yourself through that imaginary scenario. If that's enough, just that to cause you significant anxiety, if that's enough to make you feel like this moderate amount of anxiety where you're not having a full blown panic attack, but you're definitely not comfortable, that's the perfect place to start for exposure. And you work your way up to there, right? You, you use that as a starting place and you keep going through that imagined scenario and allowing yourself to sit with the anxiety, allowing the anxiety wash over you and keep moving forward with the imagined scenario. And eventually, once the imagined scenario is not enough to really cause you that peak in anxiety, then you kick it up a notch and maybe you're actually going to campus, but not um, teaching yet. You're going to visit or just, you know, going to campus and, and, and lingering around there and then leaving. Or maybe you're doing a shortened day where you only have a few classes or you're teaching shorter lectures or something like that. But the whole point is for each step, you're focusing on sitting with that anxiety and working through it rather than avoiding it and, and trying to just get relief from the sensations. It comes down to uh, the concept of reinforcement. Um, you have positive and negative reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is basically exactly what it sounds like. You know, you, you have a kid do something and you give them praise or a treat and they do more of that behavior. Negative reinforcement is not what most people think. Negative reinforcement does not mean that you're giving somebody bad attention. Negative reinforcement is when you're actually reinforcing them by taking away something bad. So like when you take a pain pill to get rid of a headache, that's negative reinforcement. You're going to take more pain pills in the future because you got rid of the bad feeling of pain. So in this case, the avoidance gives you a lot of negative reinforcement, right? You get immediate relief from the panic symptoms by avoiding the situation that was causing them. And so that's going to make you do more and more of that avoidance, right? So you can see how you get stuck in these little cycles. So rather than avoiding it and trying to get that relief, you want to try to approach and build a tolerance to the anxiety, get better at feeling that anxiety. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. Okay, our friends at OpenFit are back again as a sponsor for the podcast. OpenFit is a simple streaming service that allows you to take the workout um, from the gym into the comfort of your living room or wherever you'd like in as little as 10 minutes a day. And the idea is to take all the complexity out of getting fit, or in my case, I'm trying to lose a little bit of weight, and it's been helping with that. Um, We know that physical fitness is really important, not only for mental health, but for the health of your brain. This is something that I've been learning more about recently. Your brain needs physical fitness to stave off things like Alzheimer's disease and other degenerative disorders. And so I've been trying to step up my game in terms of the fitness. And I think that you might want to as well, if it's something that you have some room for progress in. So OpenFit is a great way to do that. They know that all bodies are different, so they personalize things to your needs, and they have a lot of really, really good content. For me, I usually try to fit these into the spaces. So for me, I talked about before, my favorite is the 600 seconds workouts with Devin Wiggins. He's a celebrity trainer, and it packs basically the impact of a longer workout into just a fraction of that time. And this is good for me when I'm not able to get to the gym or not able to, you know, go out for a run or something like that. And I only have this amount of time to put into it. I can do one of these from my living room and still feel good about that and make some progress with the day. You can access these anywhere. You could view them on your computer, your web enabled television, tablet, smartphone, Roku, wherever. They have the different streaming classes, but they also have resources. They have guides. Their website is really good as well for some of that. So OpenFit, really good app, really happy to be supporting them and having them support the podcast as well. So if you're interested in joining me and using OpenFit to help you on your journey to a little bit of a healthier life, you can do so by joining the special extended 30-day free trial membership to OpenFit. So you text DUFF, D-U-F up to 303030. That's DUFF to 303030, and that'll give you full access to OpenFit, all the workouts, nutrition information, all of that totally free. Again, just text DUFF to 303030. Standard message and data rates obviously apply, but I don't think that's a major issue these days. Just go on Wi-Fi or whatever if you're really worried about it. So text DUFF to 303030 and join me on this uh, progress bandwagon.
because usually the feeling of anxiety itself isn't the problem necessarily. It's your reaction to it. It's how you feel about that anxiety that you're feeling, how you feel about the feeling, you know, how you emotionally feel about the physical feeling, if that makes sense. It sucks to feel all the physical symptoms of anxiety and have the swirling thoughts and everything that can come with it, but it's not inherently dangerous to you and you don't necessarily need to escape. Again, there are some cases where it does reach that level where it just makes sense to, but uh, anxiety is going to tell you that you need to bail out a lot sooner than you do. And what you need to do is get better at being anxious and doing what you need to do at the same time, you know, get better at being an anxious person and still kicking ass. They're not mutually exclusive. So, you know, as you give yourself a chance to stand up to your anxiety and, and try not to let it limit you, you might have the happy side effect of actually getting less anxiety from situations that used to knock you down. And that's just sort of a byproduct of that. But you don't need to focus on getting rid of your anxiety entirely. You need to focus more on how you're interpreting that anxiety and not letting that anxiety limit you. You said that you know about exposure, you know, so this may be preaching to the choir a little bit, but I did want to make sure I clarify because a lot of people think they're doing it, but actually go about the whole exposure process, building a hierarchy, working through the steps in the wrong way. Even a lot of mental health professionals don't know how to do exposure the correct way. So I've had certainly a podcast episode about that. You can, you can go to my website and just search for exposure, deftthesych.com, use the search bar, look for exposure. I have a podcast episode and a YouTube video about it. Um, if you really, really want to go in depth, you would want to check out my online course, which is called Kick Anxiety's Ass. You just go to kickanxietycourse.com and you can see all the all the different um, curriculum there. But I do a full in-depth version where you know you're looking over my shoulder as I write in a journal, going through and developing a hypothetical scenario where you're working through a hierarchy and uh, going through all the ins and outs of it. So if you want to know a whole lot more about that and, and really the step by step, check out the course. Um, but aside from that, aside from you know building a tolerance to the experience of anxiety and getting better at being that way. I think for you personally, there's probably some room to work on your thoughts here. There are definitely some assumptions that you have about the situation that you might need to challenge. For instance, I think I hear a bit of what I would call catastrophizing going on. So catastrophizing, like meaning a, a catastrophe, turning something into a catastrophe. So this basically is when you take a little nugget of something that's bad, like something does indeed suck, it's not great but you blow it up and turn it into this sort of end of the world scenario where, oh my gosh, everything is, is going to be bad because of this. Um, so like, for instance, if you were to go to work and end up having a panic attack when you were teaching or when you got there, something like that, that's not the end of your story. That's not okay. Boom, done. You know, my, my, my job is over. Everything sucks. I'm, I'm never going to come back again. I have to find another job. It's not like that. That's a very, very black and white way of looking at it. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. You can have a panic attack and not just sort of like fake your death and go find another country to teach him. There are always options. You know, even if the scenario that you're dreading, the one that you really don't want to come true, even if it does come true, there are still options for you. So it's important to challenge yourself to try not to be so black and white about it. As I mentioned, maybe there's a way to ease yourself in. So rather than going back and just teaching, bam, full time, same way you were, and throw yourself into the fire and deal with it, even though that can be a good scenario. Um, if you just give yourself all the way over to it and, and don't give yourself any wiggle room and teach the same way you did before, uh, if you can tolerate that, then that is a good strategy because you'll, you'll basically force your body into submission and get through it one way or another. But for a lot of people, that's really, really difficult. So instead, maybe you can have a reduced schedule um, you can give yourself the option to cut lectures short if you need to. You can also communicate with others about what's going on. So like you said, you love the people that you work with. I, I assume that's teachers and staff, uh, maybe the administrators. So maybe you could reach out to them for support and kind of just clarify. I'm sure they know you had a medical situation going on. They may not know about the anxiety part, but you could tell them that you know, you've been having these panic attacks ever since your procedure. You could even say it's something that happened to you before and they're happening again. And this would simply let them help them, you know, understand what your behavior means. You know, it helped you not feel like an idiot. It's like if you act in a way that's different than the way you're used to, the way that they're used to, sometimes that could be embarrassing or you feel like they might be making so all sorts of different assumptions. But if you tell them what's going on with you, they can take that behavior in context and know, okay, you know, 
they're not just avoiding me, they're super anxious and trying to get through that, something like that. They can take the behavior in context and understand it based on what you told them. Um, you could also, I'm not sure what age students you teach, but uh, in some cases it might be appropriate and cool to let them know about it too. Like if it was a college class, like if I'm putting myself in your shoes and it was a college class that I was teaching, I might say something like, so, you know, I had XYZ operation and ever since then I've had these brutal panic attacks. I used to get these when I was younger and they're back and they're not feeling good. So I need your guys' support. If I space out for a second, please bear with me. If I need to go get some fresh air, bear with me. And, um, you know, we'll do our best and get through this together. We'll, we'll get back into the groove. It's just going to take some time. And something like that would be something that, you know, a lot of people would be very empathetic to. And, you know, they wouldn't like pity you or it, it, it very likely would not get weird, but it would help them again, understand what's going on with you. And, you know, maybe they give you a little bit less shit than they normally do on a, in a normal lecture or something like that. So that could be good. You also might want to make some plans for coping, you know, for, for dealing with this. Say you are there at school and you're feeling extremely anxious. Well, that doesn't mean that you just sort of drop everything. You can do something about it. What can you do about it? Um, there are many options, and this is going to be personal to you. You know what coping strategies are best for you. You know what is realistic within the bounds of your job and, and the circumstances there. But um, potentially, you could excuse yourself to the restroom for a moment. You know, you could say, oh, boy, um, I guess lunch is running through me. Let me uh, slip out to the bathroom. I'll be right back, guys. Uh, just talk amongst yourselves or go on your phones or whatever and just do that. Um, you could step outside, get some fresh air in the same way. You could call for a break in class and let everybody get some fresh air really quick. Um, you could have something on standby, like some videos or um, other sort of non-intensive activities that you can turn to um, so that you personally aren't in the spotlight as much and you're not counted on to be, you know, the perfect lecturer. Uh, same goes for like worksheets, anything that's a passive activity. You could always break that out and, um, rely less on yourself to lecture the whole time. And this could help you get used to being there without having to instruct so much. And it could almost be like its own form of exposure where you're in the classroom, but you're not putting as much pressure on yourself as you normally do. But you know, this is something you're going to need to brainstorm a bit. Think about what your likely pitfalls are, the areas where you're going to run into some trouble, given your history, given what you know about your job, and then don't just stand with that give yourself some options to cope with it. Really take some time and brainstorm this. Another thing to consider is, um, and I'm not sure if you're on medication or not, but if you're on medication and you use like an emergency medication like Xanax, it might make sense for you to have that on hand. Um, or if you know your doctor thinks it's appropriate, taking like a half dose or even a quarter dose prior to class can help bring you down just back to earth to where you can actually focus a bit. Um, we, we do this in my job when I'm testing people. So say I'm testing somebody in their cognitive abilities, looking for something like dementia, but they're super, 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 super hyper anxious. There's a certain, um, like a, like a, like a balance that needs to be met on one hand, Xanax and medications like that are a bit sedating and they can slow down how you think. But then again, if someone is so anxious that they're not able to focus at all in the testing, it's going to be worth that to bring them back down to earth so they can focus a little bit. So there may be a situation like that for you here, but again, talk to your doctor about that part. And then, you know, you could possibly use the anxious energy to your advantage. When you think about it, the feelings of anxiety, like having a rapid heartbeat and being short of breath and really antsy. These are things that are also present when you're really excited or amped up. I like to talk about night before Christmas, you know, um, if you celebrate Christmas or any similar holiday, even a birthday the night before you tend to get wound up. Maybe it's hard to sleep. You have a lot of these symptoms that are very similar to anxiety. So if you can sort of interpret your internal state as being excited or just really sort of antsy to get started, that might bring a different vibe to it. And you could bring that energy with you, you know, be a little wild in your teaching, be a little crazy. Like you can have fun with it. Or alternatively, you can work some of that out. Maybe you need to exercise really hard before going in and trying to teach. You need to just get some of that out of your system. You know, run up and down the stairs 20 times or something like that. Whatever you can do to just get rid of some of that excess stuff that's there. And that might bring you down a few notches, give you some wiggle room so that you can actually teach and not be so burdened by all the physicality of it. 
And again, if you do have a panic attack, that doesn't have to be the end of everything. The panic attack will pass. Every panic attack does. It doesn't stay there forever. Some people have them more often than others. Some people have them longer than others, but the panic attack doesn't last forever. And when it's gone, your body's going to be a bit tired from it. You're going to be a bit exhausted from it. But that's not the end of the world. Even if you have to lose a few minutes um, of your day, of your teaching, whatever, you can come right back and keep teaching afterward. You know, say you're, you're teaching, the first class is fine, second class, suddenly you're having a panic attack, you need to go excuse yourself to the restroom, you take 15 minutes, you come back, you finish out that class, everything's still fine. It's unfortunate, you didn't want to do that, but it's not the end of the world. So I think all of this is to say it makes sense for you to start working toward being back at work. Letting things like this linger for longer and longer usually builds up more anticipation and more anxiety. And for somebody like you, it may be that letting things linger like that will build it up so much that it seems totally insurmountable. And past a certain point, you're just never going to go back. So dip your toe in, you know, have a plan for coping realize there are many ways to go about this. And I think you're going to be just fine. You know, you also need to give yourself a little bit more credit. You have been teaching for the past 15 years, even though you've had all these negative experiences with teaching. So there's something there that that works well for you. And in this case, you know, even though you feel anxious and a lot of anticipation about the potential of going back, it could be a non-issue. You could go back and actually just kick ass and totally be fine. And, and you don't even know what you were worrying about. So you have to give yourself the chance to, to see if that is the case too. But I think you're going to be great. I, I wish you the best of luck, and I'm sorry that you had this little dip down. You'll get back in it. Don't worry. Hey, friends. The Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right. This episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. You probably heard of HelloFresh. They're a meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers step-by-step -step recipes with pre-measured ingredients to your home so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. I've been loving these. Um, I really like HelloFresh, and I've been enjoying the, the boxes that I've gotten from them. They're very simple. They make you know cooking and conquering the whole kitchen thing very, very easy. For somebody like me who you know isn't the most talented in the kitchen, I can make some really good stuff. I um, am looking at a recipe that I recently made, which is the uh, cranberry apple pork chops really good stuff. They had the um, you kind of simmer some apples, you roast some carrots and potatoes, and you put it all together, and it was really good. I like that on their recipe cards, they have a little bit of extra information. So they talk about the calories, they talk about, you know, how long it takes to prep, how long it takes to make. They talk about some of the ingredients there, like in this one, they have jazz apples, so they tell you a little bit about the jazz apple. And then there are some, um, information about like if you want to take it a little bit further so what you can do with the same sauce with chicken for instance or what wine you might pair with it so a lot of really good stuff there in addition to the recipe itself um, the recipe itself is very easy to follow they have uh, pictures that's basically a six-step picture card that's delivered to you and uh, you go through everything is pre-packaged it takes very very little to make it um, they're mostly all 30 minutes max they call for less than two pots or pans. They require minimal cleanup. They're really trying to take the, um, the effort boundary out of cooking, which is really important for someone like me who is very busy, but I also like to help out every so often in the kitchen. Um, they have a lot of different plans to choose from. They have classic, they have veggie, and they also have family, which has sort of uh, kid-tested and approved recipes. So you can use any of those, and you have the option to switch between them whenever your taste might change. So I'm really loving HelloFresh. I wish they would just be a sponsor forever because I would love to get their boxes all the time. And you should too. Uh, not only does it help you make really you know delicious, easy recipes, but for me, it helps to sort of expand my culinary horizons, You know, teaching me new techniques or different types of sauce to make, different preparations of foods that I can add to my repertoire and skill set, even when I'm not using the boxes. So I'm a big fan of HelloFresh. I think you will be too. So for you guys, the listeners, HelloFresh is offering $80 off your first month. It's basically like getting eight meals for free. So what you do is you go to HelloFresh.com slash Duff80, so eight zero, and enter the code Duff80. And uh, it's all caps, so HelloFresh.com slash Duff80, promo code all caps D-U-F-F-8-0. And that will get you $80 off your first month, like I said basically getting eight meals for free, really good deal here and a great opportunity to try out HelloFresh. I think you're really going to like it. 
Okay, so second question here. Um, this is the one that does talk a little bit about uh, like self-harm, suicide, and it's also um, this person's struggling, so the tone is, is pretty negative related to self-concept and stuff, so just be aware of that. So here's the question. Um, starts off, I hate myself. I think I'm ugly and the worst just because I've dated guys who you only use me for sex. I was believing in their friendship before anything happened between us. We were talking a lot for months. We were friends. In the beginning, I was fine. You know, guys are immature. They don't want to settle. I was glad that I'm physically attractive. But since a few weeks, I've been having these intrusive thoughts that are coming out of nowhere. Like, you're worthless. If you were prettier, they would stay with you. None of them did. Kill yourself. It's so bad that when I look in the mirror, I hate what I see. When I'm in public, I look at other girls thinking that the guys for whom I fell would definitely love them. In my head, all the girls around me are attacking me like some evil creature in an old Disney cartoon. I'm 22 years old now. Three years ago, I won a photo session. I always thought I was pretty, but now the self-hate is killing me. Other problems I'm having are clearly a product of anxiety, but this one is not. It's not typical girly low self-esteem. I know that not everyone can be Penelope Cruz, but it's getting out of control. I'm going to listen to your podcast and read your other books, but this is kind of a fresh problem of mine. So for the time being, I'd be great, very grateful for some words of explanation. Currently, I'm going to therapy, but my psychologist is making me even more confused. Basically, the problem of anxiety in Poland is like a taboo. That's why I'm looking for your help. I'm really afraid, and I'm sorry for the chaotic language. So obviously, the person's uh, from Poland, not possibly not a native English speaker, so the, you know, language is uh, not exactly the same as if I were to write it, but very clear, easy to understand. Don't worry about the language if you're listening. So man, this one, this one hurts my soul. I, I feel really bad about this one. Um, you don't deserve to feel this way. And it, and it hurts me knowing that you do. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people can probably see themselves in this question, other listeners, especially those of you who identify as female. Um, you know, I've never been to Poland. I'm far from an expert on the culture there, but here in the U S there are a lot of problematic, you know, underlying patriarchal concepts that can really convince you that your worth is based exclusively on the male driven concept of, of what should be beautiful or your body's ability to serve man or procreate, right? It's, it's easy to, um, read the writing on the wall and feel like that is, those are the things that you're supposed to judge yourself by. And you're worth much more than that. I hope that I can help you realize this a little bit. Before that, before we get to some tips I have for you, I'm glad to hear that you're seeing a psychologist. You did throw around the concept of suicide. So, you know, you had the sort of intrusive thought of kill yourself. And it can be an intrusive thought. There are certainly plenty of people that have thoughts like that, that are out of place and that scare them and they would never turn to actually harming themselves. However, you just need to keep an eye on it. You need to be honest with yourself and with your healthcare providers and your supports around you. If it turns out that you are actively considering harming yourself, something needs to be done about that. So obviously you're not in the US. So I, I just did a quick little Google search and it looks like they do have a suicide hotline for Poland as well. So the numbers they gave are um, 5270000 or 5270988. They also had a website, which is, uh, I don't know what it says, but it's P-O-M-O-C-T-E-L, P-O-M-O-C-T-E-L dot free dot N-G-O dot P-L. And then uh, same thing, the email helpline is P-O-M-O-C-T-E-L at free.ngo.pl. And I'll put these links in, in the show notes. If you go to duffthesyke.com slash episode 158, I'll put all this in there as well. Um, but those are some tools that you can use if you need to, right? If it comes down to it, don't suffer through it alone. Call the hotline, do something, get some help with that. But yeah, you know, you, you said the topic of anxiety seems to be taboo there. And I said this before on other responses, but I think it could be very helpful to basically continuously flood yourself with positive content. Even if you feel like you're getting mixed messages from your care providers, keep listening to podcasts, reading books, watching videos, all the things that you might take in about these topics that you're trying to get help with, just like you are right now. 
you may not be able to force the negative thoughts out of your mind, but if you constantly, you know, have your headphones in listening to positive, helpful content or watching things that are going to be, you know, giving you ideas about what you can do about your situation, if you're constantly doing that, at least the negative thoughts are going to have to compete for space in your brain with this other stuff, and that may help them become less powerful. So just some background, some stuff to think about there. Now I want to talk about ways that you might work toward changing your self-perception, because I think there's a lot of work that can be done there. First off, you are definitely following into some thinking traps, which are basically, you know, not fully logical ways of thinking that serve to make you feel even worse than you do now. One major one is emotional reasoning. That is when you, just because you feel a certain way, like emotionally, you assume that that's true. And it can sort of turn into a bit of a confirmation bias. You feel a certain way about yourself, whether that's rooted in reality or not, right? So the way that you feel about yourself is right now pretty bad. You feel like you're worthless. You feel like you're not pretty. You feel like all the things you described. And that may or may not be rooted in reality. I'm assuming it's not rooted in reality. But you start to interpret everything that happens to you through the lens of that belief that you have about yourself. So since you think you're worthless, you're going to interpret what happens around you as proof that that feeling is true, right? So because you have this sort of hypothesis about yourself, everything that happens around you, you're going to assume is proof of that. When that may not be the case, there's a lot of other stuff that is proving the opposite point that you're just ignoring or filtering out. So what you want to do is try to incorporate some other perspectives and any evidence that you have to help sort of unprove that negative hypothesis that you have about yourself. So when you find yourself making assumptions about what other people's behavior says about you, so when they act a certain way, what that says about you, It can be helpful to use the uh, best friend trick. A lot of you guys know this one, especially if you're part of the email list. I've talked about this before, but the best friend trick is basically think of somebody that you care about deeply. So a friend, a family member, somebody close to you. And then you think about if this situation were happening to them, would you make the same conclusions that you are as you are with yourself? So like if your best friend told you that it seems like all the other girls are out there to get them and would rather be with somebody else or sleep with somebody else because they aren't pretty, would you let them get away with that? Probably not. You know, most people would not. They'd say, no, that's bullshit. You're beautiful. You're worth being treated like a queen. Like get over yourself. You know, you would say all the things a normal friend might say to somebody. So when you think about it externally, when you put it into the perspective of somebody who is a friend or a family member, you can sort of reveal the way that you actually feel about the situation, even though, you know, your self judgment is sort of clouding that right now. So using the best friend trick is a way that you can get a little bit of clarity about that. And it also might be helpful to start to shift the focus away from just physical beauty. You know, right now the metric or the, um, what's a, what's another way to put it? That's, that's, that's not so culturally bound. Um, the, the way that you're judging yourself, the thing that you're using to judge yourself is physical beauty. You know, you're using some sort of physical criteria for beauty, and that's the metric that you're judging yourself by. And when you base your self-concept, the way you feel about yourself on something like that, of course, it's going to be risky. It's a little bit volatile. There are so many things that matter more than just physical beauty, especially since physical beauty is something that's so subjective. It's so personal. Everyone's going to have different opinions about that and different perspectives and and different preferences. So when you sort of hang your hat on physical beauty as the thing that you judge yourself by, uh, that's that's not very stable. That's not very um, reliable. So rather than attacking the feelings of being ugly head on, Maybe you can try to increase feelings of being competent or being a good person, being productive, being thoughtful, any of these other positive aspects that don't have anything to do with the way that you look. Maybe you can try to focus on bringing those up and elevating those rather than working so hard on pushing down the feelings of being ugly or not being worth it or something like that. Trying to achieve a little bit more balance there. Uh, One way that you can do this is through positive affirmations. I I know they may sound cheesy and it might sound funny coming from me, given my sort of approach and perspective, but, um, you know, research does support the idea that uh, writing down positive affirmations about yourself can help change the way that you perceive yourself. 
Now, I don't mean like you're being totally unrealistic, right? You're not going to write down, I'm the best person in the world. Nothing could ever stop me. Like these really dumb, rosy things. But you want to write things that are true, right? So you could say um, something that's rooted in reality. Like I've never let down a friend when I said I would follow through with something or um, you know, I get great grades or anything that is true and is a positive affirmation about yourself and a good exercise, uh, even things like I'm worthy of love, you know, the, the kind of simple stuff that you might hear anybody say to you, I'm worthy of love. Um, people have thought I'm attractive before all sorts of things like that because they are true. And a good exercise you can use is that when you're feeling negative and you're having these bad thoughts about yourself, when you catch yourself having one of those negative thoughts, um, force yourself to stop and write down five to 10 positive affirmations to balance it out. And five to 10 can sound like a lot, and it is. And that's the point. You want to push yourself. You want to really, really force yourself to get at least five, if not more. And what research says is the more, the better. There is, there is a correlation between how many of these things that you're able to get out and how much better you feel. So when you catch yourself with one of those bad thoughts, stop the flow, stop the drift, if you might say that, and write down five to 10 positive affirmations to try to balance it out. They don't have to be directly refuting the negative thought, but just anything that's positive and true, write it down. You can also use these affirmations in other ways, like you can put them in prominent locations, like um, put them on your mirror, on the lock screen of your phone, or just make a point to read through them every day. You know, when you wake up in the morning, if you have coffee or breakfast, when you're doing that, pull out your booklet of positive affirmations and read through them to sort of prime yourself to be thinking about that. Basically, this is directly fighting against the negative bias that you already have by trying to train your, your attention to have a more positive bias. And you're just trying to kind of balance things out a little bit. It's also important to remember that you know, the negative self-talk that you have isn't necessarily true. Thoughts are just thoughts. And we don't really have the power as humans to, to sort of really, really like manifest things just from our thoughts, right? Just because you think you're ugly or unworthy or worthless, that doesn't make it so magically. Um, that doesn't change anything that you've done throughout your life or all the stuff that's led up to that point. Just because you have that negative thought, that's just a thought. That doesn't actually mean it's true. It could be an indicator that things are going that direction or something like that, but it's not just like this magic wand where because you feel that way, it is true. You also want to try to focus on giving yourself credit for your accomplishments. You know, this is very much like the affirmations, but giving yourself credit for stuff that you do well. I usually have people integrate this into their daily journaling practices. Again, it could be a challenge, but you need to practice it. You know, say, oh, I did this well. I did that well. This was really cool of me when I did this. I think a lot of people would appreciate this, things of that sort. Uh, if you need help, you can ask other people for feedback. You know, what do they think is good about you aside from looks, aside from physicality? What do they think is good about you? And that could be a way to sort of prime the pump and get you thinking about it. And what I'll leave you with is an entirely different strategy, which is, you know, you might want to try to work on focusing on something else, meaning take the focus off of you. So rather than focusing so much on your worries, on the things that you're trying to stop doing, place some of the focus on other people, do some volunteering, or make a point to go support your friends way more than you normally do, or your family way more than you normally do. Go to some of those, you know, music shows or art galleries or soccer matches or whatever, and give support to other people. And that will help you to let the negative thoughts exist in the background because you have other more important things to focus on. The negative thoughts don't always have to be the most important thing. So thank you for the really good question. Again, it, it hurts to know that you're feeling so bad about yourself. I think that you have it in you to, to make a little bit of progress toward not feeling so shitty about yourself. It's tough though. As I said, there are forces that sort of work against you in terms of just you know society, the way that women are treated, the way that things just work in that way, but that doesn't mean you can't make progress here. And again, I think that taking the focus off just the physical realm and focusing more on, you know, the other aspects of you as a person can be really, really helpful. So I hope that my thoughts are helpful for you and I wish you the best of luck. Okay. So last question, this one is a little bit shorter. 
It reads, I'm wondering if you have any advice for how to decide if you should stay with a therapist when a change makes continuing very inconvenient. Mine is moving her practice about an hour away, but I'm sure this would be applicable to others whose insurance has changed or who have had other big life events occur. For background, I've been seeing a trauma therapist for about six months now. I've only recently become stable enough to really start digging into processing my trauma, and I'm feeling set back and defeated at the prospect of having to start over with someone new. I've made a lot of progress with my current therapist. She said I'm welcome to continue with her if that's what I want to do, but my abandonment issues have me concerned about my ability to trust her anymore anyway. Thank you again for all you do. So, yeah, um, this is something that, that I think is a great topic to talk about because you're right, it is fairly common. Um, it's always a bummer, though. It's always allowed to be a bummer. It's never going to be a fun thing to deal with when either your therapist has to move or their practice changes. They Some circumstantial thing pops up that doesn't make it easy for you to work together anymore or makes it impossible for you to work together anymore. That's always going to suck because... Um, you know, you, you put a lot of trust in this person. It takes a while to get the ball rolling and it is what it is, but you have options. You know, I think for you though, it's not particularly unfortunate that this is happening in the context of trauma treatment, because for trauma, it can definitely take a long time, as you mentioned, sort of, or alluded to with abandonment issues and such, uh, it can take a while to build up trust and a good working relationship with somebody. This is something, though, that I think you should probably keep processing with your current therapist. You know, her moving her practice likely has nothing to do with you personally. I'm sure you're not going to get a full answer as to why. Maybe you will. It depends on how you know open your therapist is. But a lot of times you're not going to get a full comprehensive answer as to, you know, why she's moving. But there could be a lot of factors that have nothing to do with you, like the price of the office rent where she is right now or um, life changes for your therapist that she's not going to talk about in session or other things that are just purely circumstantial and are not personal whatsoever. But whether or not you decide to stay with your current therapist, it's important for you to realize that your treatment, your current treatment has been a proof of concept. You're able to get into the murky shit, right? You're able to get into the trauma and start unpacking it with someone. You're able to trust somebody with your burdens you're able to stand up to your trauma without letting it force you into hiding all the time. You've proven that to yourself, and that's really powerful. I know that you don't feel necessarily like you might be able to do that with somebody else, given you know the, the, the abandonment that you feel right now, but this is a proof of concept. You know you have it in you to do this, and that's a good thing because I imagine that's not the baseline that you started from when you first started getting treatment. Will you have a little bit of a dip? You know, will you have to get over the disappointment if you have to find another therapist? Yeah, you know, it's that's part of the deal. It's not going to feel good. But you do know that you can do it now. You've seen the potential there. And also, it's important to take a step back and say, you know, am I actually stuck in as much of a bind as I feel like? An hour away is pretty far for regular sessions, though I've certainly had people do that for me. It's, it's you know, I drive about an hour to work every day, so there are weirder things to do once a week. Um, so, but it is less convenient. But maybe you could get creative with your therapist to sort of bridge the gap and make it work for you. For instance, you could I could see a scenario where maybe you go into the office in person, maybe once a month or something like that. And then on the other weeks, you have phone sessions or video sessions. It, I'm not sure where you are, but if you're in the United States, it's perfectly legal for your therapist to have online sessions with you over the internet. I actually have several patients that I see exclusively online that I've never seen in person, and we make fantastic progress regardless of that. Um, online therapy, uh, telephone therapy is really just as effective as um, you know in, in-person therapy as long as there isn't some factor that prevents it from being so. You could also plan on finding a local therapist, something that's closer to you, but in the meantime, continue with your current therapist as a bridge and have her help you create a plan for transitioning, right? So maybe you're going to travel that hour to see her regularly for the next month or two, but your plan is to make a transition to see somebody else. And, you know, you could work on that together. You can have her help you with that transition. If you do stop with her, I think it would be good for you to have some sort of closure, the two of you together. And, you know, sort of wrap up the work that you've done together rather than just abandoning ship and stopping all to, you know, it just immediately and abruptly. 
she was never going to be the only resource or tool to help you solve your trauma, right? This was never going to be the, the, the only thing that you ever needed and the end all be all. It was maybe the first thing that started making a dent in this, which is great. But at some point, your chapter with her would come to an end. So either way, you know, you want to spend some time together, uh, you know, ideally together, but also maybe on your own, just looking at the progress that you've made, writing down important lessons that you've learned, even quotes from session, things that you want to take with you as you sort of close this chapter, if you do decide to move on. And working on a project project like this together, and you could do it a variety of ways. Um, with my patients, I've, I've done this just verbally and talked about it. I've given people journals where I kind of give them some ideas to write down in it. I've done sort of emergency boxes where you we put together a lot of lessons that they've learned and progress they've made and package it up so if they ever have, need it on a rainy day, they could pull it out. Something like that can help you feel less abandoned because it's not an abrupt end. It's not like they're just dropping you. And it will also help you realize the work that you have put in, the progress that you have made, even if it's only one step along your journey. So, you know, again, it, it sucks. No if, ifs, ands, or buts about it. It sucks. You know, you definitely have some options here, though. Give yourself permission to have mixed feelings, to feel grief about it. Uh, keep processing it with your therapist right now if you can. Try to work on your thoughts of abandonment and realize that this is not personal. There's, they're not leaving you. This is just something else that got in the way. And if you can be collaborative in any way and, you know, make the transition together so that you don't feel as abandoned. And, you know, of course, again, see if you can continue seeing her, even if it's in a modified way. She said, you know, you're welcome to continue seeing her. So maybe there is a way for you to do so. And you don't even have to have a big road bump and an interruption in your progress right now. And you can save that for another time. So hopefully that gives you some ideas to work with, you know, obviously not a great situation for you, but, um, you know, it's also not insurmountable. And as I said, you've already proven to yourself that you're capable of doing this, which is, which is really amazing. So thank you for that question. And that brings us to the end of the episode. This has been episode 158 of the hardcore self-help podcast. If you want to check out the full show notes for this, where I have, um, essentially a full transcript of each question. If you need to go back and review anything, any of the links that I talked about, all that good stuff, just go to duffthepsych.com slash episode 158 to check that out. And I will be seeing you guys next week for an interview. Until then, take care and I'll see you later. Bye.